give me those hand things like you're there hey everybody how are you doing it's really strange to be doing this via zoom and even stranger because you're not doing it via zoom you're doing it via youtube so I don't even have the like uh, Hollywood Squares boxes of people watching me. Um, but I do hope everyone is healthy and well. I wanna thank Jen Brown and the Frostburg Center for Literary Arts for inviting me to do this. Um, and I hope that uh, it is something useful for everyone. Um, I'm talking today about song and creative nonfiction and the way we can incorporate music into our writing. And to begin, I think the question is, well, why song? And first of all, it's one of the original human art forms. It probably predates any sort of visual art. Uh, it probably coincides with the birth of music, but for as long, uh, with the birth of spoken language, but for as long as we could communicate using rhythm and pitch, there has been some sort of musicality. So music is really ingrained into the fabric of our evolutionary being. Second, it has a long and close relationship with language and story. Uh, poems were sung long before they were on the page. Um, they were often accompanied by music. Um, and if you think about some of our favorite songs, they tell stories. Many of them tell stories. And of course, most of us can remember lyrics to a song, but not remember like the name of some of our students, for instance. Um, thirdly, at least for writers through Generation Z, music has had a huge impact on our formula, formative, formative years, which is to say that psychologists suggest that persons' musical tastes get cemented between the ages of 13 and 15. Uh, so if you think about the sense of nostalgia for writers, but also the sense of uh, how important that time is for developing our own identities away from our parents and our families, establishing that sense of who we are. Music is pretty key to that. And lastly, popular song, and by that I mean, you know, any song being promoted commercially at this point, uh, often engages key human emotions and psychological principles. Uh, for more on this, you can check out the great book called Rock and Roll Wisdom, by the psychologist and psychiatrist, Barry Allen Fisher, who's a professor at Columbia University. It is uh, terrific at examining uh, bits of song lyric and how it engages our emotional and psychological being. Um, we all have favorite songs and we all have songs that speak to us. Um, so, uh, normally here I would ask for questions, but uh, I don't have that real-time feedback. I believe Jennifer is uh, curating questions, so if you have anything, please type them, and I'm sure she'll give me some sort of hand gesture so that uh, I know when I pause to take a question. Um, as far as writing is concerned, it's important to recognize that these days, Memoirs by musicians, memoirs about music scenes, memoirs about record collecting like this one, Vinyl Countdown, um, have all become popular in the last few years. And the writings of music critics like Grail Marcus um, uh, have become a part of our publishing landscape. Uh, and particularly both in mainstream publishing and, as I think it's important since this is the Western Maryland Indie Lit Festival, um, in independent publishing. Uh, PM Press, who was a longtime player at the Western Maryland Indie Lit Fest, 
publishes books about uh, music and popular culture uh, significantly. Um, and there have been numerous books by uh, City Lit Press and um, Kaderis Press, among others, who have appeared regularly at the Indie Lit Fest, working with music. But we don't have to be a musician to write about music. You don't even have to use original language to describe it. The fact is, um, Graham Sharp, who wrote this book, was a music reviewer for years. And he mentions that after a while, there are only so many ways you can talk about an electric guitar being played or drums being played. It is impossible to have to be fresh with our descriptions. It is more important when talking about music to have our descriptions be personal. That what we are looking for in creative nonfiction is that way to talk about the music as we need to in the language that is particularly ours. We are not writing objective reviews in creative nonfiction, but personal reflection. Song then becomes a way of flavoring a piece, but it can also be in many ways, ways of controlling a piece of writing. Um, and so I'm gonna read an excerpt from my forthcoming creative nonfiction book, which is called The Pursuit, A Meditation on Happiness. There are no seven virtues without the seven deadly sins, gluttony, lust, avarice, pride, despair, vainglory, and sloth. No positive charge without a negative charge. Non-duality. Every battery demonstrates this. Every physicist understands. Who hasn't indulged in some of these? Worse, who hasn't in virtuousness suffered pride and vainglory? Irony isn't lost in the search for happiness. We live in a time of irony, a time when being cool and detached is the stance that leads to less hurt and less reward. If our actions are ironic, then nothing is at stake. Happiness requires living with something at stake. In this, it's unlike the cool of Fonzie, who loved his adopted family and his friends. Kierkegaard said, life is not a problem to be solved, but a reality to be experienced. Irony mediates our ability to experience things in their full spectrum. Ask the motorcyclists who want to ride without helmets. They accept it's a risk, but the risk comes with the rewards those of us in cars can't understand. Nearly 20 years ago, I went to see Tom Jones perform at a casino in Michigan. I went because I thought it would be a gag. I went, dare I say it, as a practice in irony. In my mind then, Jones was cheesy and his playing in a casino in what might have been described the middle of nowhere in the Midwest seemed like a setup. I was living in a small Michigan town at the time and had little, I told myself, to do most nights. So I saw this as a way to get some kicks. The audience would be a hoot. The songs would be straight out of my mother's record collection from right before I was born. And I could sit in the back and take notes. Such was my arrogance. In fact, Jones blew me away. He was Tom Jones. He threw the microphone from left hand to right. He danced in his manly fashion that he mastered in the 1960s. He was gracious, grateful to be performing and generous with his set, playing nearly two hours. He put on a show. He loved his songs, loved singing them, loved his band, loved his audience. There's really no other way than to say it. He blew me away. I sang along with What's New Pussycat and It's Not Unusual and Delilah and laughed not with smugness but a kind of glee that was surprising when women still threw bras and panties at him on stage. At set end, I was glad for the encores and clapped until my hands stung. 
It would have been terrible to have maintained the filter of irony, for I would have lost so much. Happiness, it's not unusual. And I'm gonna now jump ahead. This book is written in fragments. So um, I play music because it brings me joy. I play music with a band because it forces me to be part of a working community. Each of us with jobs, each of us contributing, each collaborating to make something bigger than what we might do individually. We all have a role and the sum of what we do is greater than each of us. I like the shared values of being in a band. We play punk rock, just loud, assertive rock and roll. Someone said I was too happy to play such angry music and perhaps they're right but the anger and security and the hurt boy inside me needs a release. We used to cover Wear a Happy Family by the Ramones. The family's dysfunctional, fucked up, funny. In the Ramones, every member shared the surname Ramon to suggest brotherhood. My own family of musical outcasts in this Western Maryland enclave has become part of a greater community. And we're happy even if our troubles never end. We know we can overcome them together. One of the things I learned from punk rock is the importance of scene, of community. If everybody chips in, who books the bands, who publishes the zines, who finds a venue, who puts people up, the community thrives. People get the enjoyment of seeing bands play the music they like, maybe even some of them doing it well. Scenes have a shared sense of values that have nothing to do with politics or religion or sexual orientation. They are about working together to make something bigger happen. This is a model for better communities in general, but it requires a sense of inclusiveness, not exclusiveness. When I read about another African-American killed by police, I flinch because it emphasizes that the community at large sees blacks as other and it shows a side of the United States that is ununited, non-inclusive. I've been the outsider, the misfit, the punk. I empathize with that sense of otherness. The Partridge family theme asked us to come on, get happy. The Beatles told us happiness is a warm gun. The Kinks assured us everybody's gonna be happy while the buzzcocks ironically let us know everybody's happy nowadays. Reagan Youth asked, are you really happy? The replacements celebrated being unsatisfied. The Rolling Stones insisted, I can't get no satisfaction. Of course, I couldn't. I didn't know what I needed to be satisfied. Just another struggling human being. On Exile on Main Street, they declared, I need a love to keep me happy. And I believed them. Unfortunately, I wasn't an attentive reader at that age because the key phrase there is keep me, which implies that Mick Jagger is already happy. But even that philosophy of needing a lover to keep me happy is a lot of pressure on many of the relationships I've had. My happiness was dependent on them. For whatever good it does, I apologize to all my exes who couldn't live up to that monumental task. It wasn't their job, just like it isn't the job of my Grubhub driver to deliver my happiness on the coldest day of the year. He tried the best he could to get dinner here quickly. Those women, women who tried to love me the best they could. I just didn't understand that their role, what their role was then. I failed them in not being able to keep them happy too. The editor and me now suggests that we say happier in such phrases. I'm happy. I need a lover to help make me happier. Why? It would add another vocation to my life. Give me something to aspire to. Of course, that means seeing love not about something people do for us so much as what we do for each other. Aspiration. That's why so many times we fail, while so many times I couldn't get no satisfaction. Like so many of us, I was busy looking at what I didn't have that I forgot to look at what was there, what had been satisfied. I wasn't keeping my PMA. That's positive mental attitude. The circle jerk sang, be nice, say thank you, say please once in a while. It's a beautiful world we live in. Give your brother a smile. I remember after a particularly bad breakup, singing that song, wonderful. 
ironically and loud down Broadway, pulling bus transfers from a packet of them I'd found and throwing them behind me as two friends followed, watching to ensure I wasn't arrested. 3 a.m., a few days after Christmas, the transfers were these strips of thin pink paper and they flew off in the wind like giant confetti. One of these friends, Mark, suggested maybe I would be happy in the new year, as if anguish vanishes, vanishes when we buy a new calendar. Mark died 20 years ago. The other friend I haven't spoken to in 30. The self I was then is long gone. I'm grateful for both of them as they helped me get here. Gratitude is a cornerstone of keeping a positive mental attitude. I say thank you to those exes and friends who tried. I give them all a smile. I think there's one more that I want to read. Yeah, here it is. Music is one of those wells I can dip into to find joy. When things seem particularly dark these days, I sing a chorus from the old punk band X. I must not think bad thoughts. It's a mantra, a reminder that my thinking manufactures my reality. The world is perceived by me. It doesn't lessen the moments of despair so much as it reminds me that I have some control over the situation. Sadness, anguish, grief, disappointment, frustration, anger, rage. I must not think bad thoughts. They're here. They're a part of me. But they exist beside joy, success, friendship, love, excitement. Still, I dislike songs that feel trite. I never was a fan of Don't Worry, Be Happy, because it failed to acknowledge that worry is something we do. Perhaps it's more essential to worry, but choose to be happy. More honest, but it doesn't make for a good melody. We can't not worry. The bills need to be paid. My brother has cancer. It's below zero, and when I go to the car tomorrow, it might not start because of the cold. Worry. But look beyond the worry. I have this room, a hard drive full of music, a belly full now of food. The aftertaste lingers in my mouth, reminds me of my good fortune. Out the window, the cloud cover has gone, the snow for now done, though a dusting of it blows sometimes in the wind, makes apparitional figures that swoop and sink back onto the courtyard. Above, the moon wanes, some of its dark side exposed. I'm reminded it's called the dark side because it's unknown. It remains thanks to tidal locking on the far side of the earth. Maybe that's a metaphor. Is the moon presenting a mask that hides its dark side the way we all do? We have to acknowledge the dark side, but somehow keep it so that we're tidal locked. This takes practice, a reminder that our dark side is with us, but isn't us. Maybe that's why I like Sheryl Crow's song so much. If it makes you happy, why are you so sad? Non-duality. So what I've done is I've tried to show a way that song plays a part in how I think about happiness, how I think about life. The book, which is part memoir, part philosophy, part pop cultural exploration, uses song as one of the touchstones in the meditation, the way it is a touchstone in my everyday life. So there are things to keep in mind when using music in writing. Song lyrics are copyrighted text and fair use doctrine only goes so far. You can use about two lines of song before you start hitting the copyright issue. So when using song lyrics, you have to remember to be careful of what you use. That's the practical stuff. Are there any questions? Jen, are we getting any questions? Not yet, but this is a, uh, this is a good time for people to post questions if they have them. Uh, the, the live chat is, oh, wait, we have one. Uh, if music is where you go to find joy, what do you find in poetry? 
How do music and poetry make sense of the world or your experiences differently? I go to poetry to find joy too, and perhaps a, 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 a little deeper. Uh, John Stuart Mill says that there are two types of pleasures, higher pleasures and lower pleasures. I think in general, poetry begs for a kind of attentiveness that song doesn't. Um, so, you know, I'll put a record on the turntable and turn it loud and do the dishes or vacuum. I turn it louder before I vacuum, obviously. Um, I can do other things that that music is a place where I'm getting joy that, that does not necessarily require all my attention. Uh, it's why I can listen to music while I drive. But if I try, um, and I did this once many years ago, I, I got a cassette tape of Galway Canal reading um, and I put it on while I was driving and I did not drive well. Um, because the kind of attentive, attentiveness poetry requires is different. Um, and it's, it's different in the way of um, looking at art in a museum is different than looking through uh, images in a magazine. Um, certain things just call for more attention. Um, so there are different types of pleasure and different types of joy. Um, I do think both poetry and music give me a reminder of things. You know, we are stuck with our points of view. Um, and I think social media has made this worse, um, but we are stuck with our points of view. And what I love about, about music, about poetry, about fiction writing, about, um, you know, essays in the Sun magazine is that they remind me that my point of view is not my own. Uh, it's, what this, it's one of the pleasures I get from friends too, obviously. But um, I think that we can get trapped in, in the self. More, we can get trapped in the self as that thing that has a public image. Um, you know, people have guilty pleasure songs. Uh, and actually, one of, the, one of my assignments is actually to write about it write about the guilty pleasure song um, because it's something we often don't want to admit to. Um, and so, uh, you know, uh, I think that, I think that it, it allows for certain ways to get out of our own way, both music and poetry and fiction, of course. I think all art does that in some way. So what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to give some writing prompts uh, because uh, one, I'm a writing teacher in the end, and I love to give people homework. Um, I, I, in fact, that's what my students tell me, that I love to give them homework. I don't know why they think that, because that just means I love to give myself homework of grading. But anyway, so uh, there are... Uh, Four or five prompts uh, beyond the write your guilty pleasure song uh, as, as a way to engage your guilty pleasures. Uh, the first is autobiography and song. And this is uh, to write an essay that is a sort of eight to 10 short chapters, which is to, uh, and you title each short chapter the title of a different song. And the idea is to use the titles of the song to engage key moments in your life. You can describe childhood, a relationship, a job, et cetera, using the songs to act as subheadings and in some way color the experience. And what I love about this is that you could probably do multiple essays and never have the same songs because you might focus on different experiences. Speaking of experiences, the second assignment is the soundtrack to an experience. Similar to the last one, but more in depth. Write an essay in which music slash song or songs provides the soundtrack to an experience you had. I mean, we know this. We watch movies all the time and they have soundtracks. They control the pacing, the energy, the mood, the spirit. Um, 
my partner Mercedes loves the show Supernatural and Supernatural has more classic rock songs in it per hour episode than, uh, you know, the Alice Cooper hour on a uh, local radio station. Um, but they do, I mean, and their songs often engage the storyline in some way. Third one, what I learned. One of the things song can do is teach us about life or punctuate our life lessons. You know, that first great breakup gets you to pick that great breakup song that you never understood. And now suddenly it's there, right? Um, for me as a child, after my father left when I was uh, between three and four, uh, the song I loved in my childhood was um, Cats in the Cradle. Um, and it taught me so much about the experience of what I imagined my father's experience was, uh, but also uh, sort of allowed me in some way to get my comeuppance to say, no, uh, I don't have time for you now. Um, four, a musical memory. And this is the obvious one. For many of us, music has played a key role in some of our memories. Write about a key memory. First concert, first dance, first album, failed music lessons when you were a kid. Um, first song you fell in love with first playlist you made for somebody or better yet, someone made for you. Um, there are so many musical memories in our lives. First band concert performance when you had to wear that strange polyester uniform you didn't want to wear. Uh, but musical memories are, are so key for a huge demographic. Fifth one. My favorite song in year blank. It could be an actual calendar year or an age or a year in school. Here, the song will co color the memoir experience, but it also provides a sense of lyric content, tonal content, et cetera. Um, and I think that if you could imagine sort of saying, my favorite song in first grade, is going to be a very different essay than my favorite song, junior year in high school. And the last one, conflict in song. There are great debates about music. Beatles versus Stones. Music can really define difference. Using this difference, define, bring to life a conflict. And of course, conflict is key to good literature, tension, something has to be overcome. Uh, but I know so many couples who have different musical tastes, uh, friendships with different musical tastes, and how do they overcome that? Uh, I think could be really compelling. Are there questions or, or comments? Uh, not, not currently, uh, although I was just trying to take notes so that I could put your prompts into uh, the chat. But, um, and what I'll do actually is put those onto the, um, the space below the YouTube video so that those are there um, for anyone who might like to look at them later. And I can, I can type them up if you have questions, Jen, too. Oh, that's great. Thank you. But I, I want to say one other thing about these prompts as you go about doing them is that they allow you to do research about the song, about the era, about the band, about its history. Use the opportunity of this external information, which is a key component to expand the scope and possibility of your writing. And I think that is something people forget that when you are writing creative nonfiction, when you are writing about the self, we forget that the self exists in a world chock full of other information. 
And the fact is that these songs that are written by somebody else and performed by other people provide a way to engage and enlighten the other and to use that as a, as a mirror to reflect upon the self. We, uh, we have another question for you, Jerry. Uh, do you ever write poetry while listening to music? How does uh, the music impact the poetry, if so? I do. Uh, I listen to music. Um, uh, I listen to it even more when I write fiction because I find that when I'm writing fiction, that fast rhythm of certain bands can get me typing faster. Because I write poetry longhand, I don't have that same experience. I often, when I'm listening, when I'm listening to music and writing poems, I'm often listening to instrumental. So I'm listening to more jazz. I'm listening to more uh, ska or more surf music because I don't want other language in my way. Um, and so when, when I think of my, my work as a poet, that's true. Now, I should say I've written a lot of poems about songs. And so if I think about a poem from, uh, from Vanishing Horizon called Morning Town Morning, which uh, echoes the clash um, and London calling, I re-listened to that song multiple, multiple times. In, in my new book of prose poems, I have a prose poem called Is She Really Going Out With Him? Um, and so uh, I listened to the, that great Joe Jackson song many, many times. And, and I often will use an epigraph or a, or a snippet of song lyric um, to help color things. Uh, so uh, it does play in my writing often, mostly when I listen to instrumentals, it's often providing me just rhythms. Uh, and that's particularly why I like jazz, because it gives me a lot of opportunity to play. Other thoughts or questions or comments? Uh, I apparently can't do two things at the same time. So my, my chat um, <laughs> prompts are, are terrible. But um, really, this is just a remark. Uh, I, I was so delighted to hear Kierkegaard and Fonzi in the same sentence. Uh, so, so thank you for that. Um, yeah, the, this, this manuscript is such a hodgepodge of the things I love. It's got poetry in it, uh, not mine. Uh, it's got some of my favorite poems in it. It has philosophy in it. I was a philosophy major. I was a dual major in college. Um, it's got Buddhism in it. It's got a ton of pop culture. Uh, Fonzie is not the only. Fonzie and the Partridge family are both theirs. I don't know how the monkeys have not shown up in this book, but uh, because the monkeys gave me so much pleasure um, watching it uh, when I was a kid. And uh, I admit to sometimes watching it on me TV on Sunday morning still because it's so incredibly goofy. Um, uh, of course, lots of music. Um, it's uh, uh, so it's been it's been a delight. And, and I wanted those strange juxtapositions or what what many people would think were strange juxtapositions. But Jen Brown, not you and not me. Uh, anything else? Uh, so I have to ask, what's your guilty pleasure song? I have so many. I have so many. The okay, the fact is this, that I talk about seeing Tom Jones. I talk about seeing, uh, about loving Tony Bennett. And, and I actually say uh, in, in this piece at one point, uh, you know, somebody's going to say that's not punk rock to talk about uh, Tony Bennett and Tom Jones, which I say, I really, I have no care about being a good punk and in fact i actually think when i was when i was in uh when i was on a college radio station uh in my youth i i had a show called jerry's eclectic chair and i would mix like you know frank sinatra into the ventures into p-funk into you know the circle jerks and people would call me up and say you should play some more punk rock and and i would say okay and then i would play like you know, Mac Davis. 
um, or or like you know early outlaw Waylon Jennings, um, because I I I just don't like a lot of those monikers in a lot of ways. Um, I like good stuff. Um, so guilty pleasure song. Um, I I admit to owning. Uh, Sheik's uh, Le Freak album. Uh, I think Freak Out is uh, such a great song uh, and it's a great song to put on when you're feeling gloomy. Uh, I own uh, all the first three Village People records um, and they do get airplay. Um, you know, uh, really, uh, you know, there's, there's not anything I'm, I'm, I'm too ashamed of. Uh, so, you know, my guilty pleasure songs are legion. Um, other questions or thoughts? Well, we have a very quiet chat. That's because I have no audience. <laughs> I'm on at lunchtime. People are busily eating cold pizza. <laughs> you know, maybe just one person. But, um, well, I, I suppose we can we could maybe wrap this one a, a little bit early, but uh, Jerry, thank you for for reading from the new book, which I'm I'm so looking forward to read to reading, um, and for giving us the prompts. Uh, if you don't mind sending along that um, electronic copy, I'll put that here in the um, on YouTube. And, yeah, I'll just get them typed up. Yeah, I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, thank you, thank you again for for a, a really delightful lunch hour. Um, far more delightful than my cold pizza. <laughs> Thank you, Jen. Thank you, everybody out there in TV land.